Welcome to the Alumni Conversation Series. I am Unati Kondile, the Communications Manager at the Alumni and Development Office. Today we've got Mubele Boy, an alumni based in Los Angeles, and uh, we'll be chatting to him about moving away from South Africa and trying to find or make a living elsewhere far, far, far from South Africa. So without any further ado, hello Mubele, how are you? Hi, I'm good, thank you. How are you, Not? No, I was surviving, load shedding and everything on our side, but uh, we're, we're thankful that you were able to wait for us and <laughs> uh, be able to join us here. So let's quickly get into it. Who is Ububele? Like, where are you from originally and and st- up to when you were studying at UCT? So Ububele is born in Cape Town, but raised in Joburg. Uh, so I view myself as a Joburg at heart. Uh, my whole life I've spent in Johannesburg. And um, yeah, to come closer, that I'm going to walk in, pass in Tata. And uh, I've grown up in the city most of my life in Johannesburg. And both my parents went to UCT and they loved it with their whole hearts. Umama went to UCT via Forte, Tata said straight to UCT. And they've faced incredible adversity getting into UCT specifically in that time period of South Africa, Udata being maybe, I think it was one of two black students in the engineering department yeah. at UCT. Um, one of the very first, I mean, they were the ones who went and set up shacks in Jamie Plaza in order to protest black students um, not being allowed housing, you know. They mm. were really part of the first wave of transformation throughout the country and they loved their time despite the hardship at UCT, they loved it. And so I got really inspired to, you know, follow their footsteps, even though I'm not doing engineering or social work like either one of my parents respectively, but I am following my own path, but UCT was something that I really wanted to do. So um, I essentially, I only applied to UCT and then Umama said, hey, it's a bit risky, at least apply to one more. And um, I, when I got accepted to UCT, that was it. There was no question about where I was going to go and where I was going to do my undergrad. So it was the School of Music studying? Yes. So I did the School of Music studying music technology, um, which is a relatively new course. It started the year that I arrived at UCT, which would be 2014, um, was when it officially began as a, as a major at the music campus, so the South African College of Music. Yeah. And um, That was an incredibly interesting time for me because it's such a new stream. A lot of people didn't quite understand how it fit into the world of that campus. And so we had some of the most incredible saxophone players and keyboardists and opera singers. And um, I remember one time a kid looked at me and was like, what's your instrument? The computer. And they laughed and I, you know, it, it made me feel a little hurt in that moment. But in hindsight, it was like, yes, I, I, I'm not a maestro at all or any instruments, but I can play all of them well enough to put it all together and make a record. And that is what I'm good at, is being in the studio. And so very quickly, by the time I, I spent so much time in the studio and then I started begging people to let me record them. And by the time second year, end of second year came around, I was known to be the guy who would um, give people free recordings at the small UCT studio on, uh, at the College of Music. Okay. And uh, that's sort of how I really started cutting my my teeth um, and preparing myself for what would come, come next. What else did you do on campus? Were you involved in radio or what other activities were you doing up to? No, I wasn't involved in radio. Uh, me and a friend of mine, uh, she was doing um, film studies, film and media. We started an initiative called the UCT Live Room in which we would film and record um, up and coming singer songwriters and artists at UCT to shine a platform and shed a light on on um, the talent that is coming out of campus because we have some incredibly talented human beings I mean be- there's a band called Beatenberg where they were all like a majority of them were from UCT and they had the number one song on radio for during December let alone for like a year and it was incredible to see that there's talent coming out of UCT and we wanted to sh- give a spotlight on that. We still see now incredibly talented people like Zoe Mudeja and Dumiso Manana, or, um, or 
so there's just a bunch of uh real langa mavoso he was um there on uh, ust live room as well and so that sort of i i thought about my my time uh, very preciously and said that i want to be involved in things that further equip me for my career because job security is not guaranteed within the music industry so every extra mural that i was doing was sort of a way to learn a new skill to build into what i would do next and learn and meet people because it's so much about who you know and um just that's sort of how i got plugged into the community um outside of that i was in res so that was great for me for meeting my friends ship circles and making the real connections and you know being in the dining rooms and the dining halls and having incredibly intricate debates and um watching sports events and uh, i really loved my time that ties into the next question so for a student parents might not necessarily agree with the whole music or art career stream but for a student who's yeah. coming into the university and who wants to do this what advice would you give them to sort of transition into the university life and sort of build build a portfolio while they're here i think it's very important as a creative student to not you build your career and your education and your qualifications in tandem in parallel it is not like engineering where you must be qualified in order to be thought of as an engineer and then you can go and work as an engineer music there is no qualification it's do you want if you call yourself a musician you are a musician and that makes the barrier of entry really low uh, at the same time which is great but it's also hard because you compete with anyone who decides they're a musician and so in that sense i would say if you are coming into the the college of music um is that do well at school um but more than that find people you love to work with find um collaborators build your career real time do not think that because you graduated your final year with a first that anyone in the music industry cares or will hire you that is not the case at all i have two degrees in music no one has ever asked me for my qualifications so what those degrees gave me was one opportunities to meet people both in new york and in south africa I mean I met my production partner David Borshaw at UCT and he's an alumni of the um business science department but I met him at UCT and now we make music together we live together in this house making music full time and he's a graduate of UCT but that was meeting people some of my favorite collaborators I met at NYU um not because of the classes necessarily but because you're in these spaces uh, a friend of mine made a very funny comment that if you're studying the arts it's more like you're paying for a really expensive members club and that's sort of what it is with with um music um do well but that doesn't guarantee any success in the industry so you need to be building your career actively um as you are going through college thank you so after UCT what happens you graduate and then well i'd like to firstly say that everything at UCT i owe to Mr Theo Herbst who is an incredible incredible um lecturer and uh, he heads up the music technology department at the South African College of Music uh, my happiest day at UCT was the day he gave me my own studio keys because he was tired of staying late to lock up after me every night i'd leave at like 11 they would close the building i was like guys upper campus buildings are open 24/7 why is music campus closing at 11 i campaigned eventually they opened it until 1 which was great but mr herbs said i'm tired and what what year was this Sorry? What year? What year was this? This was in our second year. Okay. Second year so it was 2000. I think they changed the rule in as uh, 2015. Okay. Okay. 2015 where they extended the hours at the College of Music because other students were also complaining that they want more time to practice, etc. and um I I was very lucky to have some student leaders um at that time who took that initiative seriously and I went to them like, "Yo, I need more time." and they made it happen and but Mr. Herbst and uh, Meryl Fanoy those are the two great lecturers in the music technology department who um Mr. Her- I think is it's incredible because Mr. Herbst makes incredibly forward thinking experimental um like academic music and mm-hmm. I make 
contemporary pop music, which is a world he does not understand at all. And that never once made him look down on me, which is not, that can't be said for all people. Um, he said, I don't understand the style of music you want to do, but I'll do everything I can to support you in it. And he really did that. And uh, so I'm so, so, so grateful to him. Mm. Um, he's, he's really incredible. And so that led to the next step of knowing that I need to do as best as I can at UCT uh, in order to apply for my master's at NYU. I looked at NYU very much as a um, an opportunity, like a, a, a door in, a foot in. It's quite hard specifically as an African to get a visa um, for certain countries. And so the easiest path at that stage of my career for me was to get a student visa and apply to NYU. So I applied to NYU, um, not knowing how I'd get in or what, but I had a perspective, applied to NYU. When I got accepted, it became the scramble to find funding because it, I mean, in six months at NYU, you, I, it, the tuition itself is more than your entire time at UCT. So without the support of the, the, the entities, I mean, like the company's first round bank and all of these that were able to support me, I wouldn't have been able to go to um, NYU. So I'm very grateful for that. Just quick, quick, were you already practicing as a musician or as an artist before you went to New York? So um, when I arrived at UCT, I'd already had a band in high school that we were playing. We'd had two songs on radio, but low rotation. Then by the time I was in second year, we had a couple of songs. I met Ross Dawkins, who's the bass player of Biedenberg, and he connected me to my first major label placement. And that's when we started producing um, for artists signed to major labels locally. Okay. And at that point, um, we just went from song to song and they were doing decent on radio, doing well on, on pop radio, which was very exciting for us. So by the time I moved to New York, we were already having a good, a good amount of success. I left, I left for New York just as we had our biggest song, which was the song called Nalingi by Manu Worldstar. And that was one of our bigger songs and doing really well and like really launched Manu into the, into the public um, sphere. And that was around the time that I left for NYU. Okay. okay. And just in your role in that song, the beats, obviously, the composition, the yeah. production of it. So, yeah, what, what we do is songwriting and production. So an artist comes over to the studio, we sit here, we talk about what's going on in their life, what do they want to speak about, and you just start putting things together, playing chords on the piano, recording that, adding drums. You create the entire musical bed, and then you sit with the artist and you sort of try and figure out what they want to say and help them. They'll sing melodies. Some artists know exactly how and what they want to say, and you just say, cool and you guide a little bit. Sometimes it's very collaborative of like, oh, what if we say this the third line and change the melody like this in the second line? It all depends on how you can support the artist. But um, the majority of my job is creating the musical bed and then just making sure that the lyrics and the, the vocal melody that's on top of that is good. That is what we do. Okay. And then New York University, you enter, you got the funding oh. button and you studied yes. A master's in music. Master's in music technology. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, that was great. Uh, music technology at NYU was incredibly interesting because it is way more technical. I took a very technical approach to it. Um, after my time at UCT, I realized that um, it, it's actually very hard to teach someone how to be in the music industry. You just have to be in it. You have to take the steps and learn from someone who's in it. That's the easiest way to learn. But academically, it's very hard to structure it in a way that is um, that can align with the industry because it moves so quickly. You know, um, you'd have to change your career, your curriculum every six months just to keep up with actually what's happening, which is impractical. So when I got to NYU, I'm doing music technology, but um, first of all i thought i would be bottom of the food pack like i was like this is new york like the top of the top i right hear and i was so scared and then i got there and i realized that actually like our education system really prepares us well in south africa and um the americans have a slightly different approach um which i had to get used to uct is very much like 
you're a big boy now, do your thing. Uh, when test week comes, you better submit your assignments and write well in your tests, but we're not going to bother you the rest of the time. Um, which I loved because it allowed me to work on my career and then sort of shut down for six weeks and focus on school and then go back to working on my career. Whereas yeah. the American system is very every week there's a pop quiz, every week there's an assignment, there's a reading. It's very like it slowly all adds on and then you have your exam at the end, but the exam is weighted differently. They're not as important as maybe let's say they are at UCT. So it was an adjustment in that sense. But more than that, it's very technical. Like I, I wasn't really there learning how to produce music. It was more like I'm around kids who want to build their own plugins and like code their own apps. For my thesis, I build an application, which I'm now creating a startup around. Mm. So I taught myself how to code um, and coded in three different languages until I found the right one to be able to execute what I wanted to do. And it is, you know, a music adjacent application, but it's completely a technological um, solution. It has nothing to do with cooking up beats in the studio. Yeah. Is it live already? Yeah. Or? No, it's not live. It's still in the development process. Okay. Uh, but um, so I used, yeah, I, essentially I used my, my masters as a way to build my MVP for my company. And so again, it's this thing of like leveraging academia to, to feed into what you want to do career wise. And uh, I sort of did that. And then on the other side, it was just meeting people and working with other students. Uh, NYU has an incredible catalog of people who have passed through. They have incredible guest speakers come in, um, people that I never thought I would be in the same room as, let alone have conversations with. And I think this is the big um, thing I wish for for more students is just access to that information. I mean, never in my life did I think that I'd sit with someone who wrote Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror and she just sat there and she explained to us how she went about it and then I could ask her questions and this woman wrote one of the most influential songs of our time and she's just in the room chit-chatting casually and that is a weird thing and it's a it's a whimsy that I don't I don't take lightly and that is the access that being closer to your industry gives you you were speaking about that earlier off the record when you were talking about your move to New York, Los Angeles, being about surrounding yourself or actually getting in, getting into the industry. Can you talk to that now on record? <laughs> sure. Um, I think that getting into the industry, it is so much about who you know. Um, I think that talent can open a door for you but it's not the thing that keeps you there. Relationships are the thing that keeps you there. And opportunities that come your way are relationships. The way that the Beyonce thing happened for me is not like I happen to have the skills in order to make the record, right? But the way that the actual record happened was that I met someone, I took a meeting with a person who really took a liking to me, who happened to be best friends with a woman that works for Beyonce. And so Beyonce's team keeps what they're working on very close to the chest. Typically, they don't reveal anything until it's time for it to come out. Their non-disclosure agreements are notorious. Um, the amount that I've signed, <clears throat> that I signed just to walk in the building was insane. But because of the relationships these women had, she was able to be like, I think this woman should meet you. And she put me in touch with that team. And then they listened to my music and said, this is exactly what we're looking for. And that spiraled into getting invited into the writing camp for for Beyonce's album, to working with a whole bunch of other writers in the in that space and trying to craft things that came on the album and then find your way back was something that I actually made in South Africa. That but that was the one that was selected. And um it's so getting into the industry is such an interesting journey, but it's really about support and it's step by step, I mm -hmm. find. Um it's if you find people that you love working with, that often works better than trying to um, like people feel when you're being they're being networked with. Yeah. Whereas when you have real connections and someone kind of likes what you're doing, they're like, hey, we should do a thing. A, a lot of the, the artists that I work with now, sometimes it's just me going to the Instagram being like, hey, I'm such a fan of what you do. If you're ever in L.A. or in New York, let me know. Mm. And 
they'll check out some of my work to see if they like it. And if they do, they reach back out and say like, of course, let's do it. And then it happens and it's exciting. Um, and that's just a very organic way of like surrounding yourself with people that you just think are dope and then going yeah. from there. And um, yeah, it's an interesting space. <laughs> it makes uh, it's tough though. I will say that it is incredibly tough. You mentioned working with Beyonce's team. Do you want to just go into the details in terms of what the song was, what your role was, and on which album it's sure. on? Sure. So the song that I did was Find Your Way Back. I produced that song alongside my friend Robert McGuinzi. And we, my role was all of the music in that song. So we composed the entirety of the music, um, recorded it, everything and sent it over to their team. They then sent it over to a very talented songwriter named Stara, and she wrote the song. Um, and then the Queen Bee herself liked it and she put it on the album and that album was The, La the Gift, the Lion King companion mm. album for The Gift. Okay. And what makes a good songwriter? Just I'm just thinking right now, you, you mentioned Stara is like the best. What actually makes Good songwriter. I mean, we never think about that. We just because because you just feel it. A good songwriter is someone who can come up with hip melodies. That is like you need just really interesting ways to sing that like really capture you and people hear it once and sort of remember it. That's the biggest thing is like having really great melodies and then having a perspective. I think that you know there's nothing new under the sun, so it's really about saying something old in a new way. I think that as humans we feel we all feel pretty much the same spectrum of feelings throughout our lives, but it's about someone saying that thing in a, in a new way, in a way that resonates with you. And so, uh, you know, a very novice songwriter might just be like, you know, baby, I love you. Cool. We've heard that a lot of times, but a more experienced song, a novice songwriter would say that, but an experienced songwriter would say something like, red feels more red when I'm around you. Now you're like, I don't know what that means, but I know that feeling. And that's sort of, I think, what makes a great song art. Great melodies, interesting perspective. Cool. And then last question, I, I think let's focus now on the future. Where to? Where's Mubele going? Where's all of this going to? So for me, this is really a race to create um, a, a name for myself in such a way that people are willing to come to me. I would love to live in South Africa. I love the country and my home. And despite the challenges that we face as a country, it is a singular place in the world. Um, there are, there's just a warmth about the humans. And I also am very scared of being the last of my namesake to speak his Khalsa. So I, I, I think I'd have an issue with um, my kids not being able to speak my language, but that is what I'm trying to do now is create me and my production partner. We're here, we're meeting people, we're creating, we're working on these records and um, amassing notoriety. And eventually you get to the point where people come to you for a certain thing. And if that means I'm in South Africa, maybe they take a holiday out for South Africa for two weeks and hang out in the studio and then come back. And I think that's the eventual journey. But for now, it's just about financial stability and creating a serious runway. Uh, these cities, LA and New York, are incredibly expensive to live in. And so uh, it's about creating a financial runway. And really now it's doing what I love in a way that's sustainable. I think I've made a lot of sacrifices to get to this point. But now it's about, am I happy doing this thing? And that really changed my perspective recently. You know, we pushed so hard to the point where I just broke down and I was like, do I want to do this anymore? And I realized that I was just doing it wrong. Now it's about working with the, the people that I love and doing this again for the reasons of the heart and working incredibly smart. And we have a whole team around us now of people supporting us, which means you playing in a different game. You have, we have managers, lawyers, business managers, um, publishers. These are all very connected humans who are all there to support you in your career. So it's about being intentional about this, the little steps that we're making and, um, a big thing for me is like getting to the point where I can create generational wealth for for my family. My parents started off with nothing. Um, 
you know, coming from real, real poverty on both of their sides. And they've put me on their shoulders and given me opportunities that they never had. So it's my responsibility to start from that point at which they put me and give those opportunities to my children and the next generation and other people in South Africa. A big thing for David and I, as we speak about, is being the bridge um, for South Africa, uh, specifically South African musicians into the global market. Um, we are by no means the biggest names out there, but we want to, even if we're two steps ahead, if I can make that last step that I just took a little bit easier for the next kid from South Africa, that's what I want to do. And so we're constantly, you know, keeping an eye out for new talent, working with people from home, connecting them to people this side, because to be very honest, in the music industry, at least, the money is just different in the States. And yes, the price of living is very different as well. But mm -hmm. an entry level fee as a producer in the States is more than I ever earned on a song um, in South Africa. It's like almost like six times more uh, what I'd be earning in South Africa. And that's the, them saying, we're sorry, but you're a no name. So this is all we can pay you. And that's where I started out at. And um, obviously that fluctuates in the music industry is notoriously difficult to make a living in. But I'm glad to be able to be here and be in this room where I'm paying my rent and um, being able to do what I love. But I have very specific dreams of doing what I love at the highest possible level, supporting yeah. my family and giving other people from home opportunities that I might not have had. That's where I'm going. So as a UCT alumni, I think that I'm grateful to have had the experience that I had and been around the humans that I was around during my time at UCT. And so I'd encourage anyone who was at UCT and who is currently at UCT to not, uh, to not look down on the fact that you are surrounded by incredible humans. And those are the humans that I think will be in your life for a long time should you choose and take advantage of that because there are some beautiful hearts and some beautiful minds around you. I would also say that um, don't wait to get started on your career, just go for it. And as an alumni, I think it's important for me to also reach out more to other alumni because you don't know where people are five, 10 years down the line. Um, my father of, often speaks about people that he meets in boardrooms or in meetings that is like, oh, I went to school with them and they were in this room and suddenly there's a rapport and you can just text them and it's there's a trust there because I've seen that face. So I knew you when you were in the dining hall and we were trying to sneak extra sandwiches from the dining room so that we could stay up late on campus. You know, these are the connections that you can't, they're singular. And so um, I'm happy to be a UCT alumni and I hope that other people really like reach out to that network. Cool, no, thanks. What, what, what quiz were you in? Leo Marquard. Oh, Marquard. Oh my God. Right next door. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Bumele. Uh, I hope you do well that side. And we, we do look forward to seeing you coming back to South Africa um, and, you know, building that network and making it easier for other kids to also jump abroad and make songs for people like Beyonce. Guy. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was Bumele Boy uh, all the way in Los Angeles doing big things. And you can catch us on the next episode of the Alumni Conversation Series. Thank you.